Um, so, um, moving on then to, to the, the first panel discussion that we, uh, we have in this morning session. Um, and as I mentioned, we're going to be looking at how Ireland can sort of meet its potential energy shortfall in the short term, as, as well as looking ahead to, to what Ireland's generation profile and market structure will look like and perhaps what levers uh, can be used by policymakers to encourage investment and development in the necessary technology and infrastructure that, that, that will be required in this sector in the, the short to medium term. So um, uh, as, as well as being joined by Mike on the panel, I'm delighted um, to have uh, Nicholas Brown, a Global Glass Solutions Leader at McKinsey and Company, uh, Bernice Doyle, Head of Grid Services at Stackcraft Ireland, uh, Brenda Marin, Head of Sales for Centrica Business Solutions Ireland, and my colleague Peter McClay, Energy Regulation Partner at Mason Hayes and Kern. So, um, so to kick things off, I am going to just uh, move to each of you and ask you for to provide sort of a short introduction of yourselves, and um, you can do a little bit of a, a sales pitch for for your business as well, and um, and also just perhaps provide an initial comment on. On the, on the topic of, sort of Ireland's energy shortfall, uh, you know, do we actually have one? Um, and what are, you, what are your kind of high level reasons for it? And, and do you see this as being an Ireland issue or a, a, a global issue? So, so perhaps uh, Nicholas, turning, turning to you first. Thanks Owen, and uh, thanks for the invitation to, uh, to be here this morning. I really appreciate it. And I also think this is extremely topical and timely. Uh, seminar and event. Um, so as Owen mentioned, I am a solution leader in McKinsey uh, and Company. So I lead our global gas work and analytics, uh, working with our, our global team. I've been with McKinsey about two years, um, focused on this. And, and since then, I've, I've worked with, uh, with McKinsey in, in Doha and Singapore, as well as just recently returning uh, to Ireland after about 20 years uh, out of the country. And um, prior to this, I've worked with another commodity research um, and consulting firm, also focused on natural gas, and started my career in the industry working with uh, oil major Total in UK gas marketing and European gas trading. Um, I think the, the question of the, the energy crisis for me it is, I mean, every energy system is, is sort of has its, uh, has its unique characteristics, and I think Ireland definitely does. But really, this is, I think, rooted also in a, in a global, um, global transition and, and maybe global crisis. And I see three main reasons how we've ended up uh, in, this, in this position. And then I'll, I'll talk through the sort of short term and then also the, the longer term implications for this. So I think firstly, it really is a bit of a result of COVID. You know, this is one of been the major um, so global event that has resulted in supply demand mismatches in global energy. So it looked like we were gonna enter into a very deep recession. So this resulted in a, in a two year freeze on most major energy investments. However, economies have reopened, there's been pent up demands, there's been you know, very high levels of government stimulus. Um, together with uh, a growth in other, other sort of drivers of energy demand. And in Ireland, you can see this power demand is up about, about 10% in the first three quarters of this year. And that's much faster growth than supply can keep up with. I think the second factor then is, is the accumulation of, of longer term energy policies. I think in the media, you know, there'll be a lot of questions around uh, energy transition and, and you know the role that this has played but really I think it's it goes much beyond that you know we've seen other sort of accumulation of policies such as shutdown of nuclear power in Germany and um, shutdown of major gas fields in, in the Netherlands you know as well as global events such as uh, you know China trying to reduce uh, reduce coal use and pushing for uh, for gas so I think we're when we, when we bring it back into Ireland then, yeah, this is when you do see that the sort of culmination of these global factors, but also together with what's happening in Ireland. So, you know, wind is down about 20% this year. So even though it is more capacity uh, within Ireland, the actual generation levels have been much lower. You know, combine this with very high gas prices, gas prices are around 5% higher this year than, than, than previously. And uh, the result has been that Ireland's been ramping up coal, paying for imports uh, from the UK at the sort of highest levels than it has been for quite a long time. And, you know, the, co the consequence of this is really a push away from core energy policy goals, I'd say, of reduced emissions, as well as ensuring security of supply. So when we look ahead, you know, I think the implications of this 
is, is, is this actually a crisis? Well, I think a crisis is usually defined as a turning point that leads to, to a decisive change. I think it, it, it isn't in the long term going to shift the, the priority of decarbonization of the energy system. But what I think it may well do is bring back on the table other questions such as affordability of energy, how best to, to mitigate uh, concerns of affordability, and then also the uh, emphasis and, and importance also of security of supply of energy. Um, and then it, it will be up to, uh, to sort of government policymakers to, to, to ensure that there's a right balance between this sort of traditional three, uh, three level focus on, on sort of the environment, uh, on security of supply, and also on affordability of energy. So I think we will see a sort of rebalancing of, uh, of the focus in, uh, in global as well as in Irish energy over the coming years. Thanks. And maybe over to you, Bernice, just the introduction and, and short, short views. Thanks, Owen. I'm just glad to be here. Um, so my name is Bernice Doyle. I'm Head of Grid Services with Stackcraft Ireland. Uh, Stackcraft is the largest renewable energy generator in Europe, um, the largest developer in Ireland. We're active in onshore and offshore wind, solar and grid services such as batteries. Um, my background is I'm an electrical engineer and I've been in the renewable space for almost 20 years at this stage. I guess I, I've always been interested in, and passionate about sustainable energy and I've always been um, an an optimist, I guess, in terms of our ability to solve this problem because I'm an engineer and, and engineers are problem solvers and there's no bigger problem to solve than, than this, uh, this one in terms of climate change. But I also think that we're an awesomely clever species and I think we have great uh, capacity and I think we finally started to focus on the right problem. So I, I'm very hopeful. Um, I started out working with electricity um, in the early 2000s at a time when renewables was less than 5% of the electricity on the Irish grid. And, and you know, uh, uh, there was a, a lot of disbelief at the thought that we could go, at, go to a level of capacity more than 1,000 megawatts at that stage. Um, so huge changes in Ireland over the last 20 years. I've watched from, I guess, from the inside how We've, we've gone from, uh, from that kind of 5% level up to successfully meeting our 2020 target at 40% renewable electricity. Um, so we've learned how to build uh, renewable projects and we've built an industry in Ireland over the last couple of decades that's been very successful and we've, we've managed to deliver on the policy goals. Um, so I think the thing that, that is interesting to me is that we're now looking out to 2030. We need to build more capacity in terms of renewables um, and we need to, to, to figure out how to decarbonize more to get to our new target, which is now 80% of our electricity come from renewables. That, that feeds into the question you're asking about the energy shortfall. I, I, would, I would say that there's, there's two problems at the moment which um, shouldn't be conflated too much. One is, is a capacity shortage and the other is an energy shortage, um, or sorry, a, a, an energy price spike. So um, as, as Nick, Nicholas has referenced, um, the, the supply, the gas prices that have happened and the COVID bounce and low wind over the last few months is is one problem and it's resulting in high prices. Um, that's not why we're running uh, the coal plants in Ireland at the moment. That's because of a capacity shortage. And that's because we have uh, unfortunately had two major conventional units which have gone offline for unplanned maintenance for the best part of the last year. Um, and it really is a, a kind of a wake up call, I guess, that we haven't delivered enough new capacity to replace the aging fleet that we have in the country. So our policies have not been successful. I think we've maybe taken the eye off the ball there in terms of delivery of, of new capacity so that we have the buffer that when you have these aging fleet of units going offline um, as they get older, you have the buffer to replace those. Um, that's where we're feeling the pinch at the moment. And I guess, you know, what's the way out of that? Um, and and the, my view on that is that the way out of it is to um, deliver the correct incentives to build new capacity. And the way out of the, the affordability question that Nicholas raises and the, the price spikes is to gain energy independence from renewables. And that is to, to, um, to, to electrify everything that you can 
Um, I would probably differ from Mike in terms of his his views on electrifying using using um, hydrogen for the the heat and transport sector. I, I think that doesn't make sense. I think it's much more efficient to electrify. Um, so electrify what you can, and decarbonize your electricity production as you go. Um, I think that's what we need to do. I think we re need to reorient our markets from ones that are uh, focused on compensating generators for energy to a market that's geared more towards a energy production form, which is you know zero marginal cost. And so now you need to actually sufficiently compensate and incentivize uh, capacity and flexibility. So that's where we need to shift in focus, I think. Okay. And, and Peter, maybe your, just your initial views on um, on where, where we're at at the moment and perhaps why we're here. Yeah, thanks very much, Owen. Uh, for those that don't know me, my name is Peter McClay and I'm a, a partner in the energy practice here at Mason Hayes and Curran. Uh, my own focus tends to be on the regulation of energy uh, and as well as uh, route to market issues. So that the various interfaces between projects and things like the single electricity market, making sure projects can get paid for their output and, uh, and earn a decent return for their, for their investors. Um, now, I recall probably too much of the 1970s for my liking, um, and my recollection of the uh, 70s energy crisis back in New Zealand was carless days. You had to slap a sticker on the back, back of your car, which um, denoted which day you weren't allowed to use your car for. Um, so, you know, there are some fairly radical interventions available to us if required. I just hope we don't see, see carless days uh, brought to Ireland. But um, more locally, I mean, I've been working in the Irish energy space um, since I was helping the Commission um, for Regulation of Utilities design the single electricity market back in, um, in 06, 07. Um, back in those days, um, I was still uh, learning my craft, I suppose. And um, we had a lot of input from consultants and economists telling us all about metrics like the, uh, the value of lost load and things like um, the eight hour assumed period each year where, where I guess brownouts and blackouts would be tolerated. Um, I was comfortable with those metrics in a theoretical format, but I didn't. I hoped I'd never see them brought into the mainstream media, which is where they're, they're currently residing with the, um, the recent uh, talk about a, a capacity squeeze. Um, so we we bit disturbing. Um, but in terms of in terms of whether I think there's an energy short shortfall or not, um, I guess um, it's been great to hear from, from Nicholas and Bernice about um, you know the global and uh, kind of the more technical uh, explanations for whether there is or isn't one. My own view is probably that if there isn't one, there probably was bound to be one at some point um, in Ireland, just because during my time at the commission, uh, they, they enjoyed um, telling the, uh, teaching the lawyers various, various home truths about the physics of running a power system. And uh, one of the, the ones I recall is that supply and demand have to be in balance um, pretty much at all times, otherwise um, nasty things happen. And uh, it's kind of my, my take on it that that applies at all time frames, instantaneously, to, to avoid things exploding, but also more, more long-term. And I guess it's, it's kind of the long-term tensions between supply and demand that we're now seeing. Um, on the one hand, I guess, in terms of new projects, we've been focused on renewables, which, which are great for, for, for carbon and emissions purposes, but I guess their intermittency is something we haven't really um, dealt with or, or grasped the nettle on. Whereas on the other side, you've got the demand. Um, and I guess it's, uh, you know, I'm not an economist, but I think it's fairly, fairly well known that Ireland has a traditionally relatively low industrial base relative to some countries. Um, against that backdrop, you've got the arrival of these massive uh, data centers um, you know, in, in quick succession. Uh, if you look at some of the, um, the, the figures presented recently by, by Agrid to the commission, um, you know, it's just the scale of, of, of that demand that's arriving on the bars and the speed at which it's arriving. There's really is a mismatch between you know, intermittent new generation capacity on the one hand, and then this, this new wave of demand driven by, I guess, society and technological changes. So, that crunch to me is what uh, is what causing what well, is a cause of the shortfall. Uh, whether there are others now, in terms of the I guess the, the legal side of things, um, we've hitched our our wagon pretty firmly to the EU target model for um for how to design and and, uh, and run the legal structure of, of a power system. You know, back in the old days, pre pre nineteen ninety nine, I guess it was a, a monolithic system where everything was done from an office in town in terms of central planning and uh, and um, deployment of resources. But now, of course, we everything's atomized. We have uh, you know transmission system operator over here, we have the, the, the projects themselves, um, generators, suppliers, you know, a constellation of, of participants. And, um, you know, there's, there's lots of contracts intermediating those, those various players. Uh, and that's the structure we've all be become used to. And, and you know, it, it works up to a point. 
Um, it's just a, you know, it's a very different context from how things used to be done. So, you know, we need to look carefully at how we, uh, what the levers are available to us to, to manage things like this, this supply versus demand crunch. Um, and insight for me into the way the EU thinks about these things, if you look at the preamble to the latest um, electricity directive, which is part of the, the clean energy package, I'll have to read this. Um, it says, it says a well functioning electricity market design is the key factor enabling the uptake of renewable energy. Um, which to me is interesting because um, EU describes it as the key factor, possibly a bit of hyperbole there. I mean, to me, there's, there's only so much a market can do um, relative, to, relative to things like technology. You know, a market can't make renewables um, non-intermittent. They're still going to be driven by, by, you know, by, the, by the, uh, the, the availability of wind and sun for the moment uh, until you know, the economics behind storage develops. So... On the one hand, we have the EU's emphasis on market design. Um, and on the other hand, we have the, the, the various independency issues that we're still grappling with. Um, and uh, I like Bernice's comment about the fact that the current market is, is kind of based around the price discovery for, for production of electricity, um, whereas it's, it's other things that are becoming more important, um, certainly at the moment. So that's, uh, that's the way I see things from a, from a legal regulatory perspective, uh, if that's any help. Yeah, no, that, that's great. I was just reminding when you were talking about the no car, no car days. I grew, grew up in Saudi Arabia and in, in the 80s in a country that had an abundant supply of, of, of oil for the purpose of generating electricity. We had rolling blackouts quite frequently, but, um, but it was just in a, it was the necessary infrastructure wasn't in place to deal with the increased demand that was, you know, that, that was coming into the system. But Brendan, I think your ears probably pricked up when Peter started talking about data centers. So perhaps um, I think you may have a, a couple of slides for your introduction that you might want to just to, to, run, to run through as well. Thanks, Alan. Yeah, I do have a few slides actually, but it certainly won't be debt by, by PowerPoint. And um, thanks for the opportunity to present. And, and good morning, everyone that, that, that's listening and watching on YouTube. Um, just firstly, just a little bit on, on Centrica, if I can. Actually, some people don't know who Centrica is and some people do. And myself, I've been with Centrica for, for three years and having run my own company here in Ireland for, for 12 years before that in the energy space. So that's my background of 15, 16 years in the energy space. But Centrica, as a, as a company, we have about 23,000 employees worldwide and we have about 11 gig of renewable, um, renewable contracts on the management here in Ireland. And there's a lot of people know in Ireland, Borgosh Energy, and in the UK, British Gas, and then Centrica Business Solutions is is, is part of the, the the Centrica company, and we deliver business solutions, um, you know, for obviously business. And the next slide there, then we'll we'll flick on, and what we what we basically do is we we help to manage the demand between planet and profit and I don't think these two can be disconnected you know although you know we'd love them to be but they're not um so what is a sustainable business it's a it's an environmentally sustainable and it's economically sustainable and those two from all my dealings with businesses over the years and thank god I I, I think their their approach a lot of businesses changed dramatically and, and they are they are putting um to sustainability, you know, higher up the ranking, but it still needs to be sustainable from a from a, a, a an economic point of view. Next slide, there, please, Eva. Um, so, what we do as a company is we take companies on that on on that journey of of finance and and environmental, and it's a net zero, you know, target that we have, and that companies companies want net zero. So we take them on a journey through that from finding the right balance between the financial analysis of it, the installing and operating and optimizing the energy assets out there. And within the, the, the quiver of products and services we offer from solar to analytics, to measuring, measuring devices, to combined heat and power, to EVs. So it is a complete turnkey solution that people want. And I think, you know, one of the things that, that Mike mentioned earlier on was was very important actually that the value and how do we think and i think that you know as, as my parents told me years ago it's not it's not what you earn it's what you spend and we do need to be more efficient and there's no point in having all this great renewable energy but if if we're just using it in an inefficient manner it, it, it's pointless so energy efficiency and i think the next slide will show some examples of of energy efficiency 
And this is just an example that we would go into to companies from an energy efficiency point of view and see what we can do to reduce demand before we look at the supply element, what can we do to, to, to reduce demand? And these are, you know, just illustrative examples of from left to right there, there's about a five to 15% saving that could be had in insights driven savings. This is where if you understand what's happening and when it's, when it's happening, you, you can have some, some, some huge impacts there on the savings. Then there's demand flexibility values. So you can go in and you can move demand from from certain times or certain certain services to other areas and that can provide savings and these savings are not just financial these are carbon savings as well and then there's the whole energy efficiency aspect then of putting in leds and you know controls and the likes and you know um, vsds and pumps or whatever it might be and then once you sort out the, the demand aspect then you look at the supply aspect and you say well okay can we now generate or bring in power in, in, in a better way. And I think one of the challenges that we have with, with energy efficiency is, unfortunately, it's invisible. It's not tangible. Um, and I, I often compare it like to plastic bags. When the plastic ban came in in Ireland, it was great. Actually, it was a visible thing that could be seen. Unfortunately, energy efficiency is invisible, so it's very hard to measure it. Um, but I do think that there, there, there's there's nearly a cultural change that needs to happen in in how we value and and um, and use our energy. Some examples that that where where we've done that successfully here in Ireland, um, this is what, what was via the SEI here, a, a local a local school, where we were able to go in and implement a number of measures from installation to controls to upgrading of equipment and. I think as Mike said earlier, the technology is certainly there, and and uh, you know the, the solutions and companies such as ourselves are there to deliver these solutions. That was a good example of you know 63% reduction in energy uses and and the corresponding carbon emissions and increase in the BER rating of, of the school in an economic and environmental way. The next slide is a is a project that we're currently on with Tally University Hospital, where it, it, it's an energy performance contract. I think this is where the contracting element uh, of energy is moving as well, where companies such as ourselves and others are coming in and standing over what, what we say. So there's a performance element to this actually as well. So we're guaranteeing savings, we're reducing emissions, and then the, the paybacks are over an extended period of time, which in some cases um, they need to be. Um, the next slide there. And just, just on the data center aspect, and I think, uh, Peter and Owen mentioned it there. Actually, I think we've all seen, and there's there, there's enough in the media recently on on the data centres and the impact that it's having in Ireland. I, I, I don't think data centres haven't caused the problem in Ireland. They're obviously a, a factor and a contributing factor, but they haven't caused the problem. But I think it's interesting some stats to show there that in 2017 there was about three percent of the energy demand in, in the world was was from data centres. That's projected to grow to 20% by 2040. However, in Ireland, we're, we're, we're going to get to 27% by 2027. So I don't think data centers are going anywhere. I think data centers are here to stay and they play an important role in, 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 in everyone's lives today. So the, the problem which is happening is happening in Ireland first. So Ireland has a great opportunity to 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 manage this problem and to implement the best solutions that, that we have for this problem and it, it, there's policies out there and i think it, it, it it's it's well in the media at the moment from from the cru to airgrid from the uh, minister ryan the likes of, of there's different data center connection policies out there which are requiring data centers maybe the next slide there please Aoife, to to require data centers to manage their loads better and to put in on-site generation um, as a um, as a way of getting what they call the, the, the fixing of the MIC, the maximum power capacity that, that they require. Because at the moment, the challenge that, that we have in Ireland, I think as Bernice said earlier, there's a su supply demand imbalance, which is evident out there. And then there's, on the data center space, they can't get the power to where it's needed in the times that the data center is needed. 
and then you obviously have the the the, the seventy or or eighty percent renewable targets that we have by t for for twenty thirty. So those three three you know problems or challenges need to be combined in. So the current thinking in Ireland is that you know on site generation and data centers sort of having a more more integrated role in our grid and more participation in our grid is a key aspect and that's certainly part of the role that Centrica is doing is from building these solutions for data centers and operate and maintain them and also then optimizing those you know from an economic and from a financial aspect and then there's the whole sustainability aspect which which is you know is well up on the agenda uh, and uh, and increases up on the agenda there and that's the role of of hydrogen plays renewable gas heat recovery district heating and the likes one interesting thing that we're doing in that sector at the moment and the next slide will demonstrate it here is that we're we're developing out some real time carbon carbon reporting so this is if you do have you know, it could be an on-site generation on site or it could be a battery storage. So you can trigger that to charge up when the signals are right from a carbon or a cost perspective and then discharge it then when the opposite is true. And that can result in huge, you know, savings from both a carbon and a cost perspective. Um, and I think sort of that's, that's sort of my introduction. Yeah, um, thanks, Brendan. That, that that's very so. I mean, just looking at that, and you've so data center possibly going to be twenty seven percent of Ireland's energy demand or electricity demand in twenty twenty nine. Um, and, and you know, are, are those that you, you mentioned um, data center? You know, the generation or, or dedicated generation of data centers playing playing a role in. In meeting that demand um, and actually assisting the grid, is that is that technology? You know, is that is that there in the short to medium term? Is that something that will be can be implemented now to 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 assist in the the rollout of, of these data centres? Yeah, and it's, it certainly is there uh, right now. And, and again, I, I think that because Ireland is heading towards you know twenty seven percent of our energy could be used by data centers by 2027. The problem is occurring in Ireland first. So it's a global problem which is coming down the line and we're talking to data center operators and they're telling us that, you know, in Stockholm and Frankfurt and London, the problems are, are, are getting there. In Ireland, it, it's happening here first. So I think Ireland has a great opportunity to lead the way in this globally and to take the solutions that, that, um, that, that Ireland is implementing for the problems out there to take this globally around it. I think that the, there's a new data center connection policy due out in the next few days, which give more clarity or the next the next couple of weeks, will give more clarity on the position like this. And because it is a maiden voyage, I'm not saying we've got everything right yet, but certainly the technology is there, the willingness is there, the financial models are there, and the commitment there is both from companies such as ourselves and, and our, our, our data center customers and our finance partners to deliver these solutions for, for the, um, for the, the the businesses in mind and to contribute to the overall targets that Ireland has of the 30 of the 70 percent or 80 percent the updated by 2030 renewables and this I think there's a huge change happening in the energy markets where they were sort of centralized grids and I think the decentralization of energy markets is happening at a rate of knots and I think Ireland you know is at the forefront of that you know and data centers are playing a key role in it. And, and and Nicholas and perhaps you know sort of potential in, um, solutions from a sort of a gas infrastructure perspective. Um, you know, is there a role for additional gas infrastructure in, in the short and medium term? You're on you're on mute there. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it, it's it's clearly quite a quite a controversial topic, right? I think that. You know the requirement to, to maybe have some infrastructure that that doesn't become stranded uh, in the longer term i think is is a very legitimate um legitimate concern within ireland and um, i personally think that there is you know if if you are serious around security of supply concerns then probably there is a, a requirement for shorter term infrastructure um, you know, what we've seen in, in some other markets when they do have short term concerns around energy shortages 
is potentially solutions such as floating regasification. So you can lease these for five years, for 10 years, and maybe have a minimum uh, sort of throughput, which is contracted. And similarly, if, if there are concerns around where that LNG could come from, for example, you know, the, the, the ban on, on import of fracked gas or concerns about the import of fracked gas. And, um, you know, the other trend in sort of global LNG is around emissions transparency. And um, from, uh, from sort of start to finish, so you do have a view around what that is. And then you can work with the supplier to, uh, to mitigate that as much as possible um, or, uh, or indeed offset that. Um, so that can also help sort of alleviate some of the secure supply challenges that, that potentially we have now from, from relying, you know, traditionally on, on the UK, which has also reduced its, uh, its gas storage recently. Um, and, you know, it's, it's like, uh, like Brendan mentioned, like most European countries is also facing concerns and questions around energy direction and energy availability. But I think ultimately, Owen, it's, it's broader than just gas infrastructure. You know, I think clearly gas, you know, is going to con continue to have a role within the Irish energy mix for, you know, is that, you know, is that 10 years? Is it longer than that, you know, before, uh, before ultimately being removed? And then critically, it, it's going to be about power infrastructure as well, you know, and whether we can accelerate the sort of connection of the interconnector into France and what else can we do to, to manage energy? And I think the points mentioned by Brendan again on, on sort of energy efficiency, energy demand, you know, we have to push on, on sort of all levers to, uh, to manage the, the, the changes that are coming into the Irish energy mix in the coming years. <clears throat> really, that brings us back to the point you were making around, um, around encouraging electricity generation and the capacity problem, really, which is what we have. And, you know, um, maybe looking at the regulatory structures um, that are in place to incentivize and encourage generation and the right kind of electricity generation. So, I mean, do, do you think, I mean, you've probably already flagged, the, you know, whether the capacity market is sort of fit for purpose uh, at the moment, having regard to Ireland's electricity generation profile and demand? Yeah, um, I think it's not fit for purpose at the moment. I think we've got ourselves out of sync. Um, and I think that has been exacerbated by the, the data center build out in a rapid uh, space of time. So like what happens at the moment is that um, we, Ergo does a calculation every year to figure out how much capacity we need to cover our loss of load and then auctions that. And uh, there's a an auction which is, is aimed to deliver new build which is uh, four years ahead and projects which go into that auction don't have to have planning and that's all been designed to try and you know make make sure that a developer can have sight of a contract before they spend a lot of money developing a new site and pushing it through the planning process and um, that all sounds good in theory but what's happened in practice is that the the a chunk of the the new build units which contracted under that mechanism have failed to deliver and they failed to deliver because they hit serious planning issues um so there's 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 uh, there's two ways to solve that problem as i see it one is you have to fix the planning process so that projects can move through it more quickly um and you can also look to over procure if you like so assign a probability a, a failure rate to the the, the volume so that you're giving yourself a buffer for those projects that actually won't deliver in time for your capacity year. Um, I think we need to look at doing that. So we need to look at the actual structure of our capacity market and figure out how to actually make sure that we have sufficient capacity in the year that we want. So we don't find ourselves in this, uh, this crunch that we have this year. Um, and I think that uh, that really to me, you know, we, we know that there's a there's a, a demand growth over the coming decade. If we front loaded extra volume of new build, we might pay extra, you know, if all those projects came through and, and didn't hit snags in their planning process while we're trying to fix that, um, then you might end up overpaying for a few years, but you know you're going to need it towards the end of the decade anyway. So why not front load the, the capacity build out to make sure that we we um, give ourselves the buffer and, and have our security of supply? Um, so I think that's I think that's one um, one part of it. And then I think we also need to look at how we're going to incentivize uh, the, the need towards the end of the decade to um, to decarbonize that last 20%. When we hit our 80% target, you know, we still need to figure out how to decarbonize the last 
uh, 20% and we will need to incentivize the whole uh, concept of longer duration storage, be that electro electrochemical battery storage or hydrogen, um, those need to be incentivized and, and that doesn't really exist as the as it stands in the in the capacity market, I think. Okay. <laughs> I suppose on the, <laughs> your point around the, the, the failure of certain capacity options or participants, it wouldn't be Ireland if it didn't come down to planning in some way. Uh, mm. So uh, that's always, always, always the difficulty. And maybe that's uh, the great discomfort that society is going to have to put up with uh, in terms of um, decarbonizing our, our, our system. Um, and, you know, Peter, just looking at, you know, other policy and legislative levers that could possibly be used to, to encourage development and, and investment in, in assets that are needed to, to, to deal with this maybe short to medium term um, yep. shortfall and the asset uh, and assist transition. Yeah, thanks, uh, thanks, Owen. And um, yeah, great to hear from Bernice um, from, from the, you know, I guess, the, the developer side as to, as to the, the shortfalls in the, um, the capacity market, because, you know, that would have been coming to it looking coldly at the way the market was designed and um, that was what the capacity remuneration mechanism was supposed to do was supposed to provide the right signals um now there are you know there are, there's a range of other things that could also be done i mean um we're all used to seeing the pso the public service obligation regime used in ireland to fund uh renewable projects it, it's been great in attracting you know two or three gigs worth of of wind to the, to the bars i mean but there's also um sitting in the corner of the uh the Electricity Regulation Act, PSOs can also be used for things like security of supply. So, you know, the, the, there's, the, there's a potential, at least legally, for the government to go out and, and contract under a PSO scheme that's, that's designed at, at, um, at delivering capacity to get us, get us over the hurdle. Now, again, planning, I suppose, uh, will be a, be a hurdle. Um, kind of strikes me as a bit unusual that we're, you know, we're, we trust the market for certain things, um, certain incentives, but we leave a very non-market hurdle in the way of those those projects in the form of the the, the, the planning authorities. It's kind of a right hand left hand thing. Um, you'd like to see a bit more um, a bit more consistency. But it's not my job here to to uh, to uh, to do down the, the, the planning system. Um, and I guess that that's probably the more some of the more macro interventions. There are also kind of maybe more tailored interventions, which I know that the um, system operators and the regulator indeed are looking at. Uh, things like more efficient use of um, of what capacity is already on the bars, what, what generation capacity is available, what grid transmission capacity, I guess is a better way of putting it. Um, I, I know that the, the, the system operators have been engaged in a, you know, a, a long running uh, program to try and encourage fixable technology, as they call it, where you know possibly you'd have hybrid units sharing the connections that are currently occupied primarily by by larger, by larger, you know, wind projects, for example, um, and you know, I guess the idea there would be that um, when intermittency does arise, if the primary renewable asset isn't generating and exporting, something else could be, and uh, you know, it'd be a nice way of. You'd think there'd be some sort of, uh, um, I guess, symbiosis there between renewable generation and things like storage, uh, and, and batteries and, and the like. So that's that's ongoing. I think um, you know, when you come at these kind of things from a, a legal perspective. Um, there's a lot of transaction costs and a lot of contractual issues involved. Uh, just to just to um, give you my own tales of woe, but uh, you know that's that they're offering lots of uh, potential solutions. Yeah, I, I think I think that's interesting, Peter. And I wouldn't mind just going around to the, the, the panel to just to get their own thoughts on you know what what um, what we might be looking at from a so maybe an electricity generation profile and market market structure and. Maybe eight or nine years time, you know what, you know what is, what, what do people think is going, you know, going to be implemented in that time? Are, are there game changing solutions? I think there are a few few points that have been mentioned there already. Um, and, and Bernice, perhaps you you may just just touching back on the point on the 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 the, the, the role large scale um, energy electricity storage will play and kind of what we have at the moment versus what we're going to need to have for that decarbonization decarbonization of the electricity system in in, in, in nine years time. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, in Ireland today, we're we're just starting our journey in terms of storage. Starcraft built the first two projects in Ireland. Um, in the first one went live last year in April 2020, and by the end of this year, we're probably on the island have somewhere in the four or five hundred megawatt region. And um, so we're, we're we're from a standing start, we're moving pretty fast. But 
those batteries are, are largely half hour batteries. So they're designed to provide these short term stability um, grid system services uh, in the event of a frequency drop that they can they can inject active power quickly and maintain the frequency stability on the grid. They're not designed um, as multi hour or multi day storage to solve this kind of um, capacity crunch type of issue. They do play in the capacity market. Our, both our batteries are, are contracted in the capacity market, but because they're quite short in terms of the energy they can deliver, um, they're not designed for the capacity market primarily. So um, if you look at, uh, there's, there's lots of different studies in terms of air grids, tomorrow's energy scenarios. And I think one that's really relevant at the moment is the Beringa Endgame report, which uh, actually charts a path, not just to 80%, but to 85% renewables in Ireland. Um, <clears throat> it requires something like 1600 megawatts of, of multi-hour storage to get us to that level. Um, and that's anything up to kind of, you know, three, four hours. But then beyond that, you actually need um, another probably, you know, 800 gigawatt of uh, multi-day. So 100 hour plus storage to, to get beyond that. So how do you get those onto the, onto the system? Um, they, they, they have a real part to play and, and you're trying to get the cost optimal delivery of the capacity you need so there's lots of lots of the the amber alerts that you'd see and the capacity shortages are in the in the zone of hours you know not days so so actually storage can be a really efficient way to deliver on those kind of uh those kind of capacity issues yes you will also need that you know coverage of the duncan flout of the long period um of low wind and and uh and cold weather but uh, that and that will need to be covered, I think, ultimately by um, by a hydrogen or a multi day storage unit. So I think the capacity market needs to incentivize these kind of these kind of products. What's happening in other regions, you can see already in Spain and um, places like Netherlands and, and UK are looking that way is to have a specific pot or a specific requirement for zero carbon capacity solutions um, so that new build units will have to be low or, or zero carbon. Um, and that's one way of getting these units onto the grid quickly. We also need to um, tackle some of the endemic market barriers that exist so for example the market systems in Ireland don't really aren't designed for for batteries with large import capacities and how to actually trade those in the market there's there's some some actual technical issues with that so there's there's a lot of stuff that needs to be looked at I think there needs, really needs to be a kind of a stand back and look at how we facilitate this new type of capacity technology on our grid and in our market systems. Bernice and, 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 and Nicholas, I think Bernice mentioned the, 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 the role of hydrogen there and, and Mike went into quite a bit of detail in, in, in his presentation on the role of hydrogen. Um, perhaps you might have some just some com comments on that as so, so relevant to the gas industry. Yeah, no, I think I mean hydrogen clearly is going to have a, a role to play, um, and then there is you know it's one of the hot the hot sort of topics, just question of of when and when can it be uh, sort of commercially produced. And I think when you look at the sectors that it's likely to play a role in, you know it is the sort of harder to decarbonize sectors. So whether that's heavy transport like trucking, maritime maybe longer term uh, synthetic fuels into aviation, as well as heavy industries. You know, these are all sectors which, which aren't major contributors, I would say, into the Irish economy. And um, so therefore the question also comes up around what will we do with, with the sort of surplus of, of renewable generation, which may well end up in, in green hydrogen. And then there is a question of can that, can that actually be exported, which is then where I think you start to see this interplay in, uh, in gas networks you know, around whether um, hydrogen can, uh, the pipelines can be retrofitted. Um, you know, maybe one of the import pipelines into Ireland could actually become an export pipeline. So I think there are going to be considerations around the gas grid um, and, and therefore also the interaction between the gas grids and, 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 and the power network, which hasn't really uh, sort of been, uh, you know, hasn't really had, had to be considered in this way before. Um, so I do think, you know, green hydrogen potentially has a big role in Ireland, but then the question will be, what are we actually going to do with it? And I think it, it has to be uh, thought through then into uh, some type of export. Yeah, I mean, that was always, you know, 
when it was talked about at the beginning, you know, it sounded like it was going to play a role in large industrial hubs, like, you know, areas in Germany and stuff, but I, like the, the conversation has moved on dramatically in the last year or two, or, or, you know, around how it could play a role in, say, in, you know, economies like Ireland. And Mike, I saw you wrote, you were rubbing your hands there um, <laughs> when, when Nicholas was, you know, getting into the, 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 the role of, of green hydrogen. And um, I mean, what you've heard sort of, sort of Irish focused industry speakers talking about um, the situation in Ireland. You know, do you have any uh, just general thoughts on, on what you've heard over the last the last 15 minutes or so? Yeah, okay. Well, there's a lot more expertise on the Irish Irish energy situation specifically um, than I've got. But just to come back to you know the question of how are you going to deal with inter intermittency, particularly in the longer term as you start to decarb, especially as you start to decarbonize the last bit. I think uh, I think hydrogen is going to have to have a really big role in storage, even before you get to the last bit. I think the problems with electrochemical storage uh, at, at the kind of scale that you're going to start needing it are, are huge. And if you look globally at the kind of crunch point on all of that, I mean, the resources required and the mining required and all the kind of other problems associated with that, I think uh, it's important to underestimate. All of that so if you really want to match supply with demand um, yeah with uh, hydrogen is, is going to have a huge role and i think there are a couple of battlegrounds which i think are around hydrogen to be debated which are the extent to which buildings heat should be done directly through piped hydrogen or turn the hydrogen back into electricity and then use pumps and stuff and then the other the other area which i think is more of a battleground than perhaps Maybe, maybe Benice and I could debate this at some point, um, but you know, extent to which hydrogen is going to have a role on road transport, because I think there's going to be a real crunch point around grid delivery. But if, if, if we try to electrify the whole of road transport, huge transport, huge problems around uh, the stress it puts on the grid. There's also the charging time thing, uh, and there's also the problem of sheer uh, quantity of the batteries. So I think there's a debate around the scale of uh, the extent to which hydrogen is going to move into even, even lighter vehicles. Denise, I'll give you a right of reply there, just... Uh... <laughs> um, oh boy. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I mean, look, I, I guess there was, there, was a, there was a letter actually written to, um, to, the, to Boris Johnson by a, a pile of UK scientists, you've probably seen it, Mike, um, in recent weeks around uh, not looking to um, to do uh, inefficient, not making inefficient use of hydrogen. And I guess, you know, some of the key points there is that if you want to use it to heat, you have to convert your, your grid, your gas grid too. So, you know, yes, there are issues with building out the electricity grid, but to, to do domestic heating for from hydrogen, you have to convert your, your full gas grid and your domestic appliances and boilers. So, um, and it's a six to one. It's a six to one doing that, uh, providing that energy from from hydrogen versus providing it from electricity directly. So I, I think heat pumps and electrifying uh, heat is the way to go for that reason. Um, yeah, I think we could debate the the heavy transport piece, um, and uh, I suppose yeah, the, the 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 storage and the technologies for um, electrochemical as they stand today. You know, the, the supply chain is is an issue. I think that you can see that there are lots of companies out there looking to crack uh, uh, technologies for uh, electrochemical, which will will have much more. Uh, abundant I guess raw materials for for the supply so I think there's a lot of movement in that space as well at the moment. Um, so the, we've, we've a number of questions coming in from the audience so if, if it's okay with the panelists we might just move, move on to some, some, some Q&A and um, which I think is going to spark a little bit more debate in the remaining 10, 10 minutes. Um, there is um, uh, so the first question has come in from an anonymous attendee. So this is where things are, you know, you know, it's going to be sensitive. But uh, so the, the issue with, and this one, Brendan, is perhaps uh, for you. So the issue with data centers is demand at peak time. Data centers have stable, predictable load on site generation does nothing to decarbonize. Surely is the addition of storage for peak time with storage and recharge in the middle of the night the appropriate solution? Um, I don't know, Brendan or, or Bernice, do you have any, any comments on that? Yeah, certainly I'd, I'd agree that the data centers have a very flat predictable load and, um, you know, and, and as such, they can play a critical role in it. 
I, I, I think the, the, as Bernice mentioned there, I think that the role of longer term battery storage is also, is also coming into the play there, you know, in a big way. Um, I, I, I think as well, and I think it's an example out in South Dublin County Council at the moment where um, Amazon Web Services are, are the heat source for a district heating network going in. I think district heating, I think we have targets in Ireland to be 10% of our heat from district heating, um, you know, over the coming years. And I think I think district heating will, 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 will play a big role. And data centers have a big role to play in that because they have a lot of, of waste heat and a lot of the movements in district heating seems to be low temperature now. And um, um, the example that we have um, set out in Tala where, where it's a heat pump from the, the low grade heat from servers, um, you know, are, are playing a big role in it. Um, and, and I think, I, I, I personally think that the, the, the traditional model of a centralized energy system, uh, you, you know, is challenged. And I think it, it's the decentralization that is happening at the moment. And digitalization is playing a big role as well in this, you know, where people are becoming, you know, we've heard, you know, consumers and prosumers. And I think the whole community aspect is coming into it. Um, and I think, I, I said, I think digitalization will, 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 will play a huge role in it as well, actually. Um, Bernice, do you have any, any comments on that? Or? Um, yeah, um, no, I think I agree with the, the, the person putting the question in. It's, you know, data center adds base load, flat uh, demand, but you still have to, you still have to look after the peaks and, and we have to figure that out with, um, with storage solutions ultimately wherever they sit on the grid you know whether it's whether it's behind the meter at the at the data center site or, or whether it's more efficient to deploy them um more you know in in larger blocks but yeah. um we need we need to deploy it yeah so another question that's come in is the role what, what role can pump storage play in managing supply so i mean we've um, I think we've only one pump storage facility in Ireland with Turlock Hill, but uh, there was the, the great Spirit of Ireland kind of plan. I mean, is, is pump, pump storage de dead and gone as, uh, as a concept for, for large, large scale um, uh, supply? Oh, will I? Uh, do, whoever, whoever uh, maybe, if you want to take that on, Bernice, maybe Mike. Yeah, just from my perspective, I guess the um, coming from Starcraft, where we, you know, we have uh, seasonal so hydro storage uh, coming from the the guys in Norway, and we look on with envy at those. If you have the if you have the natural um, facilities for it, it's fantastic. I think um, it's a challenge in Ireland. I, I I don't think we have the the sites for it. Um, you know, the the potential there is is in the kind of um, multi-hour range in Ireland and I just don't think it beats uh, deployment actually even as it stands today probably of of the an equivalent deployment of lithium-ion um, batteries probably it's just not competitive um, I think um, for for Ireland and I'm not sure how many countries it would be for new build you know yeah you just don't have the mountains for it yeah they were going to they were going to fill the valleys with seawater I think was, was the, the the previous plan but that came unstuck Fairly, fairly quickly. Um, the um, another another question is in relation to data centers. Is rather than vilify data centers and other areas of demand growth, why not focus squarely on building out additional capacity? Delivery has been glacial in recent years, and curtailing economic growth and prosperity is the wrong focus. The planning system needs urgent change. Um, I don't think there's anyone who's going to disagree with this. Uh, the planning system requiring urgent change, um, but um, there is that just overarching. Um, overarching issue, you know, do you, um, you know, do you just keep on building out more and more capacity? But um, does anyone have any thoughts or, or on that comment from the audience? I'd concur with whoever asked the question there that, you know, data centers haven't caused the problem. I think they're, they've contributed to it, but they haven't caused the problem. The problem was there anyway, and it was going to happen. We were on a collision course. Um, uh, and yeah, I, I'd sort of, you know. Yeah, I think. I mean, I think. I, I think Brendan, that, that's right. These 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 issues don't just arrive overnight. Um, no. they're they're many years in the making. Um, and they're many years in the solving as well. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. Then there's. I think that the hydrogen topic is is causing a bit of debate as well. So we've the question is why do we spend so much time talking about hydrogen, which is only a solution to hard to decarbonize areas when we aren't decarbonizing the easy uh, to fix areas. 
It's not a good solution for home heating, heat pumps, short-term storage, pump hydro, chemical batteries, flow batteries, long-term maybe, but interconnection can greatly reduce the need. I mean, in fact, I think um, we've touched on a number of those, those points already. And I think interconnection is one of the issues that we actually haven't really you know, discussed in, in that, that, that much detail. Um, and maybe flowing from that question, um, you know, the, the, the inter planned interconnection takes, takes a number of years and we've, we've, we've been involved in advising on, um, on three of the Irish interconnection projects, you know, um, in place and planned, but, you know, do, does the, 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 does the panel think that, um, you know, further interconnection will be required, um, um, in Ireland to in the, in the, the medium to, to long term future. You want to take that on? Or can we can we solve this? Can we solve this domestically with say um, the Green Link, uh, the East West interconnector, and the, the the Celtic interconnector? I mean, I'll just. Chip in one quick comment, which is I don't think it's uh, instead of, it's as well, it's probably as well. But um, yeah, the, the more you can do your multi-month storage at scale, the less you'll need an internet connector, right? Yeah, yeah, I'm, and so the, these, these plans for super grids um, across, uh, across all the seas um, and down to uh, the, the Sahara for the, the solar. I mean, you know, those kind of plans are, you know, are they way off? Does the, the storage solution, you know, mean that that level of infrastructure and, you know, coordinated um, delivery by a number of different um, states, they no longer require it? If we can deal with the solution locally with long-term storage and local power generation? I would have thought that if uh, intermittency of you know, climate-based renewables is your problem, then unless you're connecting to interconnecting to somewhere outside that that weather system, uh, you know, you'll have the same problem with the, the, the jurisdiction to which you're connecting. Um, you know, in some ways, the the, uh, the value of the connection assets is that they allow access to um to other sources of uh, energy. Um, I don't know if anyone wants to talk about nuclear, but I suppose that's um that's illegal in two or three places in the Irish statute book at the moment. But you wonder whether that position will will hold long term. It's, a, it's illegal to generate, but it's not illegal to consume. It's the way we're operating at the moment. So. And I mean, just to, to look at the question, really, it, it's also around how to decarbonize. How, what, you know, how, how do you sort of solve how to decarbonize sectors, right? I think there is a lot of talk around hydrogen. Um, and particularly that's been driven by countries which which do have sort of large industries which are hard to decarbonize and therefore they're concerned around you know what are they going to do with these sectors and are they going to lose them to uh, to other countries that that maybe can uh, you know can meet the heat requirements or can produce hydrogen more cheaply but I think you know their options all the options listed in this question I think are great but you know there is also a potential role for for a sort of renewable gas or, or biogas you know for these so sort of that last 20 percent of demand which which Bernice mentioned, and um, that maybe can't be, uh, you know, retrofitted or can't be met by a heat pump um, and, and can then still use existing gas infrastructure. So I think there is also sort of non-electrical uh, solutions that, that should also be considered and therefore that, that can also help sort of decarbonize uh, or manage the emissions of Irish agriculture as well. So I think, you know, really should think of uh, sort of a broad solution space for, for these hard to decarbonize sectors and really come up with the best one for each, uh, each country. Um, the last question then um, is from, from Simon Breyer is in Everose and um, the government, the Irish government has recently announced an increase in the renewable targets to, to, to 80% by, by 2030, but um, given the ongoing delays with auction processes, planning grid rollout, um, where do the panel think we will realistically get to by 2030? Bernice, I'm, I'm looking directly at you on this. Yeah, and keep my head down. Um, <laughs> look, as I said at the start, I'm an optimist. Um, no one believed we were going to hit 40% renewables in 2020, and we did it. Um, I think we can do it. I think there is a real change in focus. I think that the next panel is going to be really interesting because offshore is a real key to what we have to get moving on the offshore side of things. Um, and 
I think Airgrid has done a really good job with the Shaping Our Electricity Future consultation, which hopefully we'll see some follow up on in the next month or so, um, where they've laid out different um, approaches to delivering on the, the build out of further onshore and offshore wind. And, you know, there's a lot of new um, ideas in there, I suppose, new in terms of being realistic options that Airgrid is looking at in terms of building um, HVDC connections, new technologies like dynamic line ratings. There's a whole host of stuff that we haven't even got into yet in, in, in the 2020 timeframe from a technology perspective. Um, but it does need, I think, a form of, as lots of people are referring to the whole NFET, um, you know, experience with COVID, which was Mike, our um, Irish kind of uh, task force for dealing with COVID, which we, a lot, most people I think think did a really good job at communicating to the general public and, and having the technical expertise interfacing with the government decision makers. I think we need something like that um, to get us there. And I think we can do it. I, I, I think we have the technology. It's not that we're looking for, for new technology. It's, it's building infrastructure is hard and we have, to, we have to start doing that. There's no getting away from it. Um, but I, I, I think it can be done. Yeah, well, I think that's that's a very good good note to, to end on. I think we just see you know the repurposing of say the, the climate advisory council into some kind of action task force. I think it's you know, a very sensible suggestion. Um, I'd like to to thank everyone for uh, for joining us uh, for the, this this panel and and thank particularly the uh, our, our speakers uh, Mike Berners Lee, Brendan Marin, Nicholas Brown, Bernice Doyle, and Peter McClay. 